So I would like to now um, introduce and welcome the director of our Center for Autism Research and Treatment, Dr. Dan Geshwin. Dr. Geshwin holds the Gordon and Virginia McDonald Endowed Chair, and he's a distinguished professor in neurology and psychiatry. Uh, he's also the vice chancellor for precision medicine here at UCLA, and he's a world-renowned expert in um, autism genetics. So without further ado, thank you, Dan Geshwin. Thanks, Susan. Well, it's perfect. Um, Julian went, went over a lot of information, and I'm going to touch on some of it again, and then kind of uh, you know try to tie a bow around it at some level. So we'll see how that works. Um, I do. I these are my conflicts. I'm on the scientific advisory board of Ovid Therapeutics, which is trying to develop treatments for autism, as well as a couple other companies that aren't really uh, related to that directly. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is. Um, we're in the midst of a genetics revolution, this notion of precision health, and I think you can hear from Julian's uh, presentation um, that it's not something that's coming in the future, it's actually happening right now. Then I'm going to discuss what genes have been identified in a very broad way, and what these genes mean for clinical practice and treatment. You heard some vignettes there that give very kind of practical, real-world stories I'm going to back up a little bit, go to 30,000 feet, and kind of look at the field a little bit more broadly. But I think understanding these specific cases will put some meat on what I'm going to describe to you. So first, I'll talk about precision medicine. What is that? And like, why am I talking about that in the context of autism? Well, what you heard from Dr. Martinez was that autism, there's a, there's a part of autism that's a collection of rare disorders. It's probably a fifth to a quarter. And so therefore, we're talking about hundreds, if not thousands, of distinct conditions that have autism, which is a syndrome, as its main manifestation. And therefore, and it, and it may be, just like for cancer, that there'll be different therapies for different forms of autism. So the goal of precision medicine is to deliver the right treatment every time to the right person. And of course, we have a problem here, which is outlined by the Danish Nobel laureate, Niels Bohr, prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future. <laughs> so we never have a crystal ball, a full crystal ball. And what we're trying to do as physicians is use the best information at our hands to give you and ourselves the best view of the future, the best we can do, what our judgment is and what we think is coming. And the notion here is that where we're really moving to, and, and I'll explain it even more in a second, is healthcare that's more tailored to you, not just to you, but to your children or and to children with autism and other disorders. So using patients' unique differences in their genes, lifestyles, and environments to predict what medical conditions they're susceptible to and what treatments are best for each individual. You wouldn't just wear any pair of glasses. You get a prescription that's tailored to your vision. Now, of course, uh, that doesn't mean that each individual in this room wears a different prescription, but you can see that, you know, we could probably group ourselves into maybe uh, 30 or 40 different prescriptions in this room. Um, and having the right one is really critical to doing the right thing. Um, there are a lot of very interesting stories around this. Um, um, there's a great story about the first fighter jets that were made. They were made uh, for the average person. And of course, uh, they didn't work for anybody. Nobody could sit. That's why we have actual, that's why our cars and our and airplanes and everything that we drive has adjustable seats. So the two major drivers of this revolution, dramatically decreasing DNA sequencing costs. So what Dr. Martinez presented as $9,500 in some cases, which was, let's say, the lowest cost you could find three or four years ago. Now the lowest cost you can find for that same test is somewhere around $2,500 to $3,000. And that's moving down quickly. And what happened is, what's shown here, which you can't really read, it's fine, you don't need to read this. Just look at the green line and look at the red line. <clears throat> this is Moore's law, the green line. That's, that, um, that's the uh, Gordon Moore, who was the founder of Intel, predicted uh, multiple decades ago that the, every 18 months, the density of transistors on a chip uh, would double and the price would half. And so that's an exponential curve right here. And that has happened. Um, this is what happened with sequencing. It's a further um, inflection in that there was a new disruptive technology introduced. And there are several others. And I anticipate that <clears throat> right now it costs us in the, just the reagents. There's a lot of other work that goes into this. But just in the supplies to do the sequencing about 
$850, it's going to be about $100 in a few years. So everybody will have their genomes done as part of um, clinical care at some point in the future. It's hard to see exactly where that inflection is. The other major part is this big data, biomedical informatics, the notion that we can um, gain insight not just from looking at an individual, but from looking at the individual in the context of the others. And in this way, we are a village. Your healthcare benefits from me participating in this data exchange, and my healthcare benefits from having all of you. In other words, we can understand ourselves best in the context of the population. So, another example is happening right now in cancer. About 6% of tumors now have genetically actionable information that changes the course of therapy and has remarkable change in care. And that is changing by several percent every year as more and more studies, research is done. So it used to be 50 years ago that cancer was one thing. Now, you know, then cancer was divided into organ systems. Now we know better than that, cancer is divided into its genetic etiologies. And so you may have um, a lung cancer or, um, you know, different types of cancer that have the same mutation, and that would get the same drug. And so the idea is now we can target treatment to that specific mutation, that specific gene that causes a specific problem. So we are at the beginning of what will be an explosion of genetic discoveries across populations as the cost decreases. The number of genomes sequenced, we have to understand is we, our genomes are immense. They're 3 billion base pairs. So if you just sequence my, you know, my genome and compare it without a lot of others, it's hard to make sense of it. We need to understand how we're different and how we're similar and how that relates to the conditions that we have. And so the idea is we'll have a much more accurate understanding of human disease. And it really is a big data revolution in healthcare. And so um, because the genomics takes so much data to analyze, but also because we'll have so many patients with genetic data, and of course, when we will analyze this data, we won't do it, you know, we'll do it in a way where the data is what we call anonymized, um, so that you're de-identified. It's not as if somebody's going to be looking at, you know, here's, here's your name, you know, Jane Doe, Dan Geshwin, here's your DNA. It will be, you know, kind of, there'll be a number, there'll be DNA, but there'll be all the clinical information attached so that we can understand how these genes really lead to things. And as, as Dr. Martinez mentioned, genetics has transformed the clinical landscape in autism, really totally transformed. And I'm going to give you an example over the last a decade. So this was a review that was written um, in 2008. Um, by a, a former postdoctoral fellow of me, uh, advances in autism genetics on the threshold of a new neurobiology. In other words, the genetics was driving mechanistic understanding. At that point, we only had a handful of genes, and I mean a handful. Little understanding of mechanism. Major pharmaceutical companies were withdrawing, in general, from central nervous system diseases. They had little interest in autism, and there were at least six companies that shut their programs down, not in autism, but in general. Circa 2016, two years ago, more than 200 candidate genes, we can define the cause of autism in about a quarter of cases. They're clear mechanistic models and major dr drug development efforts in autism at virtually every pharmaceutical company. Now, does that mean that we have drugs to offer people for individual mutations yet? No, but I'm aware of multiple things that will come into clinical trials, and these are difficult trials and our fingers are crossed. But the genetics is leading to understanding mechanism and if we understand mechanism, we can target it. So again, I am going over some territory that Dr. Martinez has, has discussed, but I think it's really important because many, you know, what we found in the past is that most people in the audience don't have a lot of genetic background, and so some of these things do bear a, you know, a little bit of repetition. So knowing the genetic basis of a disorder, even if it doesn't lead to a treatment, has substantial implications for, for understanding it. So, for example, he talked about these de novo mutations, things that occur in the egg or sperm, like Down syndrome as a great example that, that most of you would be familiar with. The parents don't have that. The children get it. It's genetic but non-inherited. It's a mutation that has occurred de novo in the germ cell. It turns out that about, and I'm going to go over this numerous times, uh, roughly a fifth, plus or minus five, you know, of children with autism are likely to have a de novo mutation. And of course, it's going to depend a little bit on their clinical presentation. If they have severe other medical features or intellectual disability, that probability goes up. If they have 
constellation of severe epilepsy, language delay, and some abnormal features that makes it even higher, et cetera. Knowing how, how that's inherited, though, has, has significant implications because some people are worried, well, if I have another boy, I'm going to have a child with autism. If it's a de novo mutation that reduces the likelihood that this is going to be inherited, it doesn't bring it to zero at all, but it reduces it, and that bears discussion with genetic counseling. And of course, for prevention, if we know the mechanism of mutation, maybe there are things that we can do um, to prevent it in some cases, but certainly even more importantly, we can prevent adverse outcomes or be on surveillance for them, like severe epilepsy that could lead to sudden death, cardiac abnormalities, or cancer, as Dr. Martinez mentioned. So there are a lot of, I would say right now, um, a very conservative estimate is that 10% of the time when we identify a mutation, it markedly changes the way that we clinically approach the patient. It doesn't cure the autism, but it really helps that patient substantially. And of course, as we understand, because most of these mutations are new discoveries, things we haven't seen before, it's going to take several years for each of them for us to have a full understanding of what the implications of that mutation is. So we're in a learning healthcare system where we're identifying mutations. It may be new mutations. There may only be 20 patients in the world with that right now. Then in a year, all of a sudden, because of social media, there are now 200 who have connected. And now we can begin to study that and understand that, et cetera. So let me give you a little bit of terminology again. And I know Dr. Martinez went over this, but I think it's worth discussing. So we have chromosomes, 23 pairs of chromosomes. And you can have, you know, just think of the kinds of mutations that occur as a um, whole range of sizes. Your DNA is a set of base pairs like an alphabet, three billion letters, A, C, T, G, repeated in different ways. You can have a single base pair variant where one of those changes. You can have smaller things where there's a small deletion or insertion. You can have duplications. You can have much larger pieces that, you can, that are the chromosomal abnormalities. And these copy number variants are things that are greater than 1,000 base pairs. So they're not visible under a microscope, but they're very visible with our current techniques. So in a particular part of any chromosome, like five, I'm just showing this. This is just an ideogram where each of these dark bars is part of a gene. So there are many genes here. And if you have a deletion or duplication, it's not just one gene that's affected, it's all these genes. And so about 10% of autism and intellectual disability is going to be caused by mutations that are copy number variants, loss or gain in these, you know, uh, of, of, of many genes. But, but every thousand base pairs or so, so we have millions of these because we have three billion base pairs in each of our genomes, um, millions of polymorphisms. Now, I know this, like, why is he telling me this? Well, because not every genetic change that we find in an individual is a mutation. Most of them are things that we all share that are present in more than 5% of us, and those are called polymorphisms. And even those can contribute to disease. You may have heard of the APOE gene in Alzheimer's disease. That's present in about 5% of people or so, you know, depending, you know, the APOE4, but um, it will increase um, certain variants, increase the risk of Alzheimer's three or four fold, et cetera. It's not causal, it's contributory to the disorder. So when, it, when a single base pair change is very, very rare in the population, it's much more likely to be a mutation. So rare, and the reason for that is simple. Evolution, over time, weeds out things that affect our ability to reproduce. If something reduces our ability to reproduce, our genome is not passed down. So big mutations that would cause us to be intellectually disabled or less, you know, have le less of a chance of reproducing, make us very ill in any way, are going to be things that are cut out of the population. And that's why a lot of these mutations are de novo, because if they were in the parents, it's unlikely the parents would have had children. But, because, but, but, they, you know, but it occurs in the egg or sperm and then is unfortunately passed on to the child. So again, this notion that genes with large effect, these mutations that are going to be kind of causal, that if you have it, you have a high likelihood of disease, are found by mutation screens done by whole exome, whole genome sequencing, or the chromosomal microarrays, whereas the other things are found in other ways. And at this point, we don't really use that that much in genetic diagnosis. 
But going forward, we will understand and have an understanding how the common genetic variation that we all share predisposes us, but doesn't cause, increases risk for or decreases risk for all kinds of common disorders ranging from metabolic syndrome, diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, to things like autism. And that's a kind of work in progress that I think in three or four years when I come to you, I'll be able to tell you a lot more about. But as, as Dr. Martinez mentioned, the human genome is rich in copper number variant. And so some are actually benign. Each of us, about 4% of our genome is either deleted or duplicated. But sometimes if it deletes or duplicates the wrong set of genes, it's pathogenic. And so although these aren't visible, we can detect these with a chromosomal microarray. And so this is that 15Q1113 duplication that um, we're seeing right here. Let's see, I'm hope hopefully, there we go. Right here, you can see there's an increase in this sig blue signal here. And that's telling us that in that small region of the chromosome, that whole bit has been, has been uh, duplicated. And so, um, so we're now able to find these, and you know, depending on the cohort, at least 10% of kids. So, um, these are some of the studies that have come out, and basically we would say that large new CNVs, de novo, are at least 6% in kind of all comers. Now, in the specially selected cases that we might see here at UCLA, where there might be intellectual disability or some kind of severe seizure disorder or some uh, what we call dysmorphology, that's going to be quite a bit higher than that. And then, as Dr. Martinez mentioned, whole genome sequencing. So in 2012 and 2016, there were breakthroughs. And based on these studies, we now estimate 500 genes contribute to autism in the population. This is a breakthrough because what's been happening is we've been increasing. Think of our view of the genome like a microscope, and we've been increasing our resolution, going from first looking under the microscope at chromosomes, like, and we can see Down syndrome, an extra chromosome 21, then going to microarrays that find submicroscopic things, things you can't see in a microscope. And now at whole genome sequencing, we're actually reading every single one of those three billion base pairs. And so we have unprecedented re resolution now. So we estimate that there are at least 500 genes, probably more than 1,000, that contribute to autism in the population. And as Dr. Martinez mentioned, there's a strong effect of uh, many of these come from dads, and there's a strong effect of paternal age on the mutation rate. So if you have children, let's say, in your 50s versus your 20s, and you're a male, the increase, it, it increases the risk of autism about three to fourfold. So it's not, you know, autism is only 1% in the population, so it brings it up in that population to 4 or 5%. It's not like a done deal. It's still 95% chance greater than that that there isn't, you know, going to be a problem. But, it, you know, but there is a subtle increase. And in 2018, I can say that we estimate, you know, we're estimating 500 to 1,000 genes. But I can say right now, there are over 100 risk genes that have been identified. And the, there are also multiple forms of inheritance. You can have, this may be a little hard to see, um, but it should be in the syllabus. You can have autosomal recessive. That's a small portion of autism. That is where both parents have a mutation. You can have autosomal dominant. Again, that's very rare. And when it occurs, it's de novo usually. So that means it's only from one parent that that de novo um, event has occurred. I'm looking to. So, you know, basically genetic testing can currently identify 10 to 20 percent of mutations contributing to autism. The other point that was brought up is that autism is often not seen alone. About 30% of patients might have intellectual disability, about 10-15% with epilepsy, and these have to, you know, and these are really um, important to consider. And so again, many genes, many genetic models, no major gene accounts for more than 1%. So we have a challenge when we're trying to move to mechanism and develop drugs. We can identify genes and we're finding them more and more. But will we have to develop a specific treatment for each disorder? Or will there be convergence in specific biological pathways, developmental stages, processes, or brain circuitry? And again, similar to cancer, people use, most of the drugs that are used, stop dividing cells, right? It's either radiation or antimitotic agents. They kill rapidly dividing cells. Now, that works in many cases, but it's not a cure in many cases. And so we've been moving towards more and more targeted therapy. But it'd be great if we had something analogous 
to the killing of dividing cells for autism. So, so don't get me wrong, I don't think that there's any problem with that, but we're moving from kind of more generic, generalized therapy in cancer to more specific. And, and, but we're trying to ask a question. Even if we have hundreds of genes, do they converge on specific biological processes that we then can treat? And the answer is yes, and I'm just gonna go over this very quickly just to, just to give you, you know, so first question is when and where do autism genes act? Do they act, this is just showing brain development, prenatal and postnatal, as well as the events that are going on as neurons are born, as they elaborate connections, as the brain begins to myelinate, that is the connections become stronger, et cetera. And so the question is where do most of them sit? And if, if we look, the vast majority of genes that have mutations in them that cause autism are, are acting prenatally. They're expressed at their highest levels prenatally. So they're affecting early development and then, and then um, that causes later problems. Does that mean that we can't intervene later? No, not at all. In fact, there are numerous examples where very early acting developmental mutations in animal models where people are using to develop drugs, like a mouse genetically engineered with mutations. They develop abnormally, they have all kinds of problems, but you can reverse them in the adult or adolescent using the proper therapy. So we're quite optimistic that even though this might be fetal origin or developmental origin, that, we can, that many of the cases will be treatable. And the kind of biological processes that these genes are converging on are things like something we call activity-dependent protein synthesis. What does that mean? As your, as your brain cells fire, they change their configuration, they make memories, they, they increase or decrease their connectivity, and that depends on protein synthesis. And that activity-dependent protein synthesis is affected by many of the mutations. And generally, neuronal activity and firing is affected by another set of mutations, as well as the way that neurons hook up with each other, the neuronal cell adhesion, how they connect. So all of these processes have been implicated. So how do we develop therapeutics? Well, we take the genetic information we have. We can make those mutations in stem cells from humans that we can get from skin. So you can take a skin biopsy or blood from somebody now, and we can take that somatic, fully differentiated cell, and with a few transcription factors, a, a few little, some genetic magic, we can make those into adult neurons. And so we can also make genetic mutations in mouse models. And I'm just showing six of them here, including this one gene that Dr. Martinez was talking about, P10, where people have made the mutations that cause autism in these mouse models, and they get similar behaviors or similar biochemistry to what's seen in humans. And I'm just going to show you how one of these can be used for treatment. We're working on a mutation that is the most common developmental disorder, neurodevelopmental disorder in the Amish called a mutation in this gene CNTNAP2. And we made a mutation in this in mice and showed that it had almost an identical syndrome to what was going on in humans. Of course, we can't, you know, it's hard to know if they're autistic, but they have a lot of the other features. However, we can look at mouse social behavior. And what we found is we tried a number of drugs. And what we found, if I can uh, see, am I going to work here? There we go. Is that if we treat them with oxytocin, it actually was effective in ameliorating their particular social deficit in this assay. So we have a camera looking down on these mice. These are both knockout mice that have the gene deleted, which is what happens in those patients, the Amish patients with autism and epilepsy. And whoops, let's go back. There's one that's treated with oxytocin. You can see the mice interacting with each other which is more or less normal, and those that haven't gotten, have gotten just a saline injection. It's a pretty remarkable finding. And it doesn't mean that oxytocin is going to work in everybody with, with autism, but there will be, oxytocin is a social bonding hormone, and in these particular mice, there is a deficit in that particular system, so it made sense to treat the mice. But the idea is, by taking that mutation, we now understand the mechanism of disease a little better, and we can begin to work towards treatments. So I'm going to end now by just citing a few things. One of them is something that I said in 2009, and so I'm proud of myself. Um, <laughs> one of my students actually put this in her thesis. I had forgotten about it, so now I put this here. The recent demonstrations in animal models that certain forms of neurodevelopmental disorders associated with autism, such as fra fragile X, tuberous sclerosis, Rett syndrome, can be reversed in, aut in adulthood, represent a paradigm shift in our concept of developmental disorders. 
Should these findings generalize to humans, genetically identified pathway therapeutics would become the most important area in future treatment research in autism. And so I'll leave you with this uh, thought, the hope of genetic testing in medicine. This is from a, a really a now famous deceased author who was a neurosurgeon at Stanford who died in his late 30s who had cancer. And he, um, here's, here, here, here's a quote from him, Paul Kalanithian. And then my health began to improve thanks to a pill that targets a specific genetic mutation tied to his cancer. I began to walk without a cane. He got us several more years with this, but it wasn't a, for, a cure, but it, but it gave him you know, some, you know, some hope at this time. This is the kind of hope of precision health, and in autism, this is where we're trying to go. So I do want to say that there are convergent pathways um, you know, that we've identified uh, and the whole field is identified that, that can be targeted. This is just a few of them when we look at a protein level or we look at certain aspects of connectivity um, and the balance of excitation inhibition. In fact, you're going to hear a lot in the next two talks about brain imaging, which I've kind of introduced you to right here. And these are brain images that show abnormalities in connectivity. And you know, there, there's really a lot of hope that we're going to be able to um, intervene in this way. So while autism risk is genetic, its etiology is multifactorial and very heterogeneous. Rare genetic variants contribute to at least 10% of the cases and may explain more. And just to highlight what was said in this session, genetic testing is warranted to identify these causes clinically. Exome sequencing is a clinical test in autism. Soon whole genome sequencing will be a clinical test. The genetics provides a route to development of new therapies. And what we do is we use that genetics to engineer animals and now new stem cell models based on humans to develop innovative treatments. So thanks for your attention.